Well, good evening. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Is this ready? Okay. Welcome to our second CUSD family evening, which we're proud to offer in partnership with Hogue Hospital. Um, we're going to get started on time. We want to value everyone's time tonight, but we will likely have more people filing in. I'm Ryan Burris, Chief Communications Officer for the Capistrano Unified School District. We have translation services available for Spanish speakers this evening. If you do need a translator, please see our staff in the back of the theater. We're also live streaming, so you will be able to see this on cusdinsider.org, and we are recording, so we'll post this on our website and at CUSD Insider, so that it'll be available um, for families who cannot be here tonight. This series is titled Helping Teens and Families Navigate Mental Health and Wellness. We're honored to have the opportunity to host this event tonight and to discuss critically important issues, ones we know parents um, are challenged with on an ongoing basis. Tonight's session is dedicated to identifying substance abuse disorders and vaping dangers. It's a topic I know many of you have shared concerns about as we travel around the district. Tonight, you'll hear from a distinguished panel of teen mental health experts from Hogue Hospital. Our featured speaker, Dr. Stephen I, serves as chief of service at Hogue Addiction Treatment Centers. Dr. I is a former director of the California Society of, of Addiction Medicine Executive Council and served on the Education Committee for 10 years. You'll also hear from Dr. Sina Safea, Child and Adolescent Psychologist and Program Director for Aspire at Hogue, Prana Rao and Dave Cook, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist at Hogue Hospital. I'd like to thank all of our panelists and our speaker, Dr. I, tonight for being here. This is something that we presented to them um, and they said yes to it. We don't, they don't charge us anything for this. They come out on their own time and we we very much appreciate them being here and, and supporting us in these efforts. After the presentation this evening, we'll open the discussion to audience questions. Um, I want to check. Chelsea, do we have the comment cards or the question cards? Okay. So if you, um, if you fill those out, we'll ask you to pass them towards the ends. As we end Dr. I's presentation, we'll grab those, and that'll be the speaker of the Q&A portion of the evening. It's now my pleasure to ask our superintendent, Kirsten Vital, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, in September, we started this series by inviting families to Capo Valley High School to hear from Dr. Safaya about the dangers of social media and the effects on mental wellness. Every day when I'm out at schools talking to families, the challenges of social media, mental health, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and vaping are the topics on parents on families' minds. We're proud to have partnered with Hogue to shed light on these important topics and address how health and education can come together to support students and their families, provide preventative resources, and make positive impacts on the mental health of all of our young people. You know, often what parents say to me is that they're, they're searching for information about the dangers of vaping, the electronic cigarette products, and often wonder how our district is responding to this growing epidemic. Guided by the leadership of our Board of Trustees, um, we are pursuing efforts to educate our students and families about the dangers of electronic smoking devices, while at the same time pursuing disciplinary action when the devices are used on our campuses. Over the last two years, the number of suspensions has risen dramatically due to the increase of electronic smoking devices on our campuses. We believe that providing education to our students and their families, this will empower all of us to understand the dangers of these devices and curtail their use both on and off campus. Recently, we were awarded a Department of Justice tobacco grant that will expand our prevention programs with the partnership of the National Council on Alcohol and Drug Dependence, um, and really the goal is to educate students, teachers, and parents on the dangers of vaping. Finally, proactive measures in partnership with cities like Laguna Niguel have provided additional resources to help combat the use of electronic smoking devices on our campuses. 
This year, we're considering the installation of electronic smoking or vape detectors in bathrooms and the Gal Hills High School, uh, excuse me, middle school, and additional deterrent to the use of electronic smoking devices, as we understand these help. They've already been installed at Dana Hills High School as part of a pilot program so that we can learn from that. Vaping is a growing epidemic amongst our youth and will take a coordinated partnership between our trustees, our staff, city leadership, students, families, community organizations to reduce and eliminate the use of this, these devices. Tonight we'll hear from Dr. Ike on the, what he is seeing from teens in Orange County. Specifically, you'll discuss the common, common warning signs of teen drug and alcohol use, the dangers of vaping, and how to approach the topic with youth, and what resources are available if help is needed. Through the year, we'll continue to have these mental health experts from Hogue back to discuss a variety of topics, including self-harm and suicide, and the overall team mental health and wellness. So we hope you find these discussion, discussions educational and helpful for your families. So before I introduce Dr. I, I just want to appreciate and share that we do have trustees here. Martha McNicholas is here, and I believe uh, Krista Castellanos is here as well. So just want to appreciate their leadership and support um, in the work that we are doing. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. I and the team from Hogue. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll have this uh, uh, session together where we can be informative and also try to answer questions and make it uh, valuable for all of you that have come and for those that are watching this. Um, I would prefer not to have this here in front of me. So I may end up going like this and like this and like this. Is that OK? All right. Um, and uh, I probably shouldn't have had any caffeine before because you might see a tremor when I do this on the thing. So uh, I have given you my advice for this evening uh, so that you're aware of that. Okay, let's get started. This is supposed to be advancing forward. Okay, so I showed this slide to Don Juan Avila Middle School to their eighth graders. And um, I got a very different response than what I just got right now, which is they were very excited. There was hooting and hollering um, for our culture. And um, so that was a talk just a couple of weeks ago. And that presents, or this represents, I should say, a real problem in our society, which is, um, well, I don't want to be too, too harsh on the Kardashians, but... Um, Okay, thank you very much. But whether it's Leonardo DiCaprio, an A-list actor, or the Kardashians, or Snoop Dogg, uh, this is what our kids see. This is a representation of what's cool. And um, when you're uh, a middle schooler and a high schooler, it's important to be cool, right? It's cool to be cool. So this is what they see, and this is what we're up against, um, certainly in the um, Instagram world. In my own family, uh, we have some of my relatives that uh, they're not Instagrammers, they don't have you know a million followers and stuff, but there is literally a drink of alcohol in every Instagram photo. It's like, did you drink alcohol at every meal you ever went to, right? And um, yeah, it looks attractive, but uh, it's a concern, right? So that's something that we see. Okay, that didn't go the right way. Okay, and then here is another way that it's made very, uh, attractive to young people. Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for cannabis ice cream. I mean, really. So you've got all your flavors there. Chocolate, vanilla, maybe that's vanilla, I'm not sure. But the point is, is that that's very attractive. And in fact, if you didn't, you couldn't read cannabis and you showed that to a three-year-old, right, who couldn't read the word cannabis, they would go, well, could I have some, right? Okay, so with regards to seniors in high school, 70% have tried alcohol. By their senior year, 50% will have taken an illegal drug, 40% will have smoked a cigarette, 
and more than 20% will have taken a prescription drug for a non-medical purpose, so a Xanax, an Adderall, a Vicodin, etc. If you start using before 18 years of age, the risk of substance use disorders, SUD, increases by 6.5%. And I'm going to show you some other slides that have those kind of statistics as well. And it's, a, it's going to be one of the take-home points to this, which is uh, essentially that the younger a person starts using, the greater the risk for a substance use disorder and comorbid conditions. Okay. And then finally, 10% 10 10 of adolescents receive treatment. So we've got a huge problem, and very few adolescents actually receive treatment, even though it's available. Okay, so this is part of why we're even having this conversation, which is the opioid epidemic. So this slide represents overdose deaths of opioids. And I think the opioid epidemic, at least in part, has shed light on substance use disorders, what's going on with our kids, and now vaping has become uh, a hot topic uh, because it's a huge problem. So there's essentially three waves to this. This is 1999, this is 2017. So in this first wave, this is when prescription pills became more and more popular. They were available um, in copious amounts. In fact, Vicodin is the most prescribed drug in the world. Billions of prescriptions or billions of prescription pills are prescribed every year, although it is coming down. So that was wave number one. The second wave was well, Vicodin and Percocet are not so available anymore. They're still out there, but not quite as available. So what is available? What is it? Anyone? Heroin, right? So heroin is cheaper and easier to get. And maybe one of the big changes from when I was a, a younger person was that if you were going to use heroin when I was a teenager, it meant sticking a needle in your arm. But it doesn't mean that anymore. You can smoke it now, you can snort it, and so taking that step to going to intravenous drug abuse is not required to use something like heroin. So it's less expensive, relatively speaking, to uh, pills, it's more available, and so we started to see this rise related to heroin. And then finally, the last culprit, maybe you can read it, maybe you can, I'm sorry the slide's not super clear. Does anybody know what's led to this huge increase? Fentanyl. Did someone say fentanyl? That's exactly right. Yeah, it's fentanyl. So when you hear that someone's using heroin, and of course I run a substance use disorder program, so I hear about that every day, that's one thing that's in my mind, but now I'm even more concerned about whether or not they're using fentanyl. So fentanyl, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, is the main culprit that's leading to overdose deaths in the United States. Okay. So another takeaway point is demonstrated on this slide, and it basically says that increased use and decreased perceived risk are in a relationship, and it's an inverse relationship. So it's, it's fairly obvious that if something is more risky, people are less likely to use it, or less likely to do it. So jumping out of a plane without a parachute is very risky, right? You don't really need a study to know that's not a good idea. So the risk is high, it's perceived high, and it really, really is high. So people don't do that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about real risk, we're talking about perceived risk. So when I was in high school, one of the rites of passage was to go to the lake where we lived. There were some cliffs around there, and it was really cool to jump off the cliffs. And the higher the cliff you jumped off, the more cool you were. And the perceived risk was maybe if you jump off a higher cliff, you're more at risk of hurting yourself. But the reality is it was a lake. And at the bottom of the lake were boulders. And so if you were off by a little bit, it didn't matter if you jumped from 15 feet up or 30 feet up or 45 feet up. You had a boulder you were going to land on, break your leg, break your pelvis, you know, crack your skull. And so the perceived risk was the higher you go up, the more risk, but that's not really true. The real risk was whether or not you were right in the spot where the water's deep and you're gonna be okay versus being off to the side where there's boulders. So 
what does that have to do with this? The perceived risk of marijuana back here in the 1970s was very low, and so the use was very high. And then in the mid and early 1990s, the perceived risk went up, and so the use started to go down. People could see the risk. And now the risk has changed, and the perceived risk versus the use. So the perceived risk is going down for marijuana, but the use is going up. Importantly, though, the risk of using marijuana has not gone down. For those of you that know, the percentage concentration of THC in marijuana has gone up by close to 20 times, at least 10 times. So in my day in high school, it might have been 1%. THC was 1% in marijuana. Now it's 20%, or it could be higher. There's all kinds of products that are out there where the THC is at a very high concentration. So the concentration is much higher, the risk is higher, but the perceived risk is lower. And one of the reasons why it's lowered is what? It became legal in 2016 here in California. So if it's legal, it must be OK. You know, er every working day of my life on the addiction treatment unit, I have people come in and tell me, well, a doctor gave me these pills, so it must have been OK. Does that really seem true? No, it's not. And just like marijuana becoming legal has not made it less of a risk. So we're going to talk about that as well. OK. So it begins when people are young, under 18 years of age. Nine out of 10 people with substance problems later in life began using when they were younger. Now, I think this is a very important slide, so I'm going to take a, a, maybe an extra minute or two to talk about this. So development. Does development matter? So here is the probability of having one or more dependent symptoms as an adult based on age of first use. Okay, so this is really critical. Less than 14 years of age, that's what's in the blue. The tan is 15 to 17, so this is middle school, high school, the end of high school here in yellow, 17 years, and then maybe starting into college age, okay? So these numbers and these, this graph is really powerful. Lifetime tobacco users. So what this is saying is that if you began tobacco at less than 14 years of age, you have about a 25% chance of being a lifetime tobacco user, okay? Just to, as an aside, the opioid epidemic is a huge issue, and rightfully so. But compared to tobacco, it pales in comparison. So I didn't put this in a, as a slide, but about 450,000 deaths per year in the United States are attributable to tobacco-related illness. About 88,000 per year are attributable to alcohol-related illness. And then overdoses, whether it's opioids or a combination of opioids and benzodiazepines or maybe something else like cocaine, is about 70,000. So 450,000 deaths related to tobacco, 88,000 related to alcohol, 70,000 related to all the others. So a lot of times tobacco gets put in a separate category, which is why we're going to talk about vaping tonight. But it is a huge problem, and it's still a huge problem. OK, so lifetime tobacco, you can see that if you start young, it's a huge problem. Lifetime alcohol users, if you start drinking in middle school, 25% chance, as opposed to even starting as late as 17 years of age, it goes down to 5%. That's remarkable, really. And then marijuana users, same thing, OK, even maybe to a greater extent. So another takeaway point from all of this is that um, the later a person starts using, the better, the better, number one, the less chance that they're going to have a substance use disorder. So if you can keep your kids, I mean, and I have a sixth grader at Don Juan Middle School, Don Juan Middle School so if I could keep my daughter from using at, at middle school age, even if she started using at high school, which is not what I would prefer, of course, she has a better chance of not developing a substance use disorder or a medical or psychiatric comorbidity. Okay. 
All right, so teen brains, they are still developing. Wow, I can't even read that. I can't expect that you would. Holy cow. And it's like a, a variegated, like, like pixelated thing up there, isn't it? Okay, so the brains are still developing. We'll talk about that. But essentially, self-control, judgment, executive functioning, all of that is developing. And our brains are developing till we're at least 25 years of age. And of course, we have some folks from Aspire, and they can tell you more about that than I can uh, because they're experts with adolescents. But our brains are primed for um, learning and developing. In fact, there's a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala has to do with novelty. The amygdala also has a lot of cannabinoid receptors in it, so interestingly enough. So the amygdala says that there's something new going on. So if I walked out of the room right now and came back, and let's say there was five people right here in the middle that left, I might not recognize that there's five people in the middle that have left, but there's something in my brain in the amygdala that says something's different, something's new. I'm not quite sure what it is. Or maybe I am sure what it is, but it's that part of the brain that has to do with new things. So now I'm a, I'm a sophomore in high school, and I've got the novelty choice of learning the quadratic equation or smoking pot on Thursday afternoon, which seems like a more novel idea, right? Okay, so our developing brains um, are excited about either, but there's all these social cues that say, hey, maybe this would be a little bit more fun. Maybe this would be a little bit more interesting. So I'm sorry the slide is not easier to read, but essentially that's what we're talking about here, that the brain is developing, and it needs to develop, right? Just like a puppy dog needs to develop into a, into a grown-up dog, uh, our children need to develop and learn skills like, you know, well, how to do the dishes at home, I guess. We're working on that with my daughter at home right now, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But to do their homework, to understand how to process a social situation, to control their emotions when they don't get what they want, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so here is the addiction reward pathway. This part of the brain is the brain stem. That's the most primitive part of our brain. That's what tells us to breathe, for our heart to beat um, involuntarily. That's what keeps us alive. This next section is called the limbic section, or the limbic um, area. And the limbic area has to do with the next order of survival, which is for us to survive beyond our heart beating and uh, us breathing, we need to eat, we need to procreate, we need fluids, right? So these are fun stuff that feels really good. You know, when you're hungry, food tastes really good, right? So this is the limbic area. And then we've got the prefrontal cortex, which translates emotion into action, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And then our frontal cortex, sort of where our executive functioning is, this is kind of like if you're a car person, this is the rev limiter in the car that says, you know, everything about this says fun and go. No stopping, green light, go. And this is what says, oh, you know what? Maybe that's not such a good idea. Or maybe that is a good idea, but I'm gonna run it by the smart part of my brain, this part that makes us uniquely human. Well, addiction lives in this area right here, and it's this release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens that's the reward. So that's the most simplified way to approach it. it it's more involved than that, but to simplify it, regardless of the substance of use. So let's say that a person's using cocaine, which is a stimulant, or Adderall, another stimulant. That produces a certain effect, which is, you know, I may be, you know, excited, but I may be nervous and agitated. My heart, bait, my, my heart beat might be up, et cetera, et cetera. So that's cocaine, as opposed to a Xanax. A Xanax makes me calm down. Um, maybe my blood pressure lowers a little bit. I'm more sedated. Maybe I feel like sleeping. Maybe I just feel like relaxing and chilling out. So two different drugs, two very different effects. But the final common pathway coming down then is release of dopamine right here. So whether it's a Xanax or a cocaine, whether it's pot, uh, heroin, Vicodin, whether it's nicotine, right? I get this release of dopamine here, and that's the reward, and that says this feels good. And then it translates that into a behavior, 
And it may be that I'm a high school student and I'm kind of shy. And because I'm shy, I don't feel like I interact well with my peers. But I have a couple of drinks and I don't feel so shy. And I'm more comfortable with you. And I think you're more comfortable with me. And I'm less worried about things. Or maybe I don't have those issues. Maybe it's just I like the way it makes me feel. Wow, I feel kind of different. I feel kind of a buzz. This is fun, right? Whatever it is, it's translating this emotion into an action, which is I feel better about myself, or I have more fun, or I'm relieved. I'm not worrying about my problems, et cetera, et cetera. OK. So we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of different substances. And we're going to first start with alcohol. So how much is too much? So what is at-risk drinking? At-risk drinking doesn't mean a person's alcoholic. It doesn't mean they have the more um, appropriate term that we use now, which is an alcohol use disorder. So the diagnosis is not alcoholic. It's not alcoholism. It's an alcohol use disorder. I have a use problem with alcohol, right? Or I have a disorder related to how I use alcohol. The disorder that I have related to use alcohol is I drink before work. Ah, that's a really big problem, right? OK. I don't have that problem, but right? That would be a big problem. That would be kind of an end stage problem, right? OK. So it might be that I drink too much at a party. Maybe I drink so much and my spouse is pissed off at me, et cetera, something like that. OK? So how much is too much? Five or more standard drinks in a setting for men, 15 or more per week. For women, it's four or more standard drinks in a setting, or eight or more per week. So for women, yikes, more than one drink per day puts you at risk for an alcohol use disorder. It doesn't mean you have it, but it puts you at risk for it. That's not very much alcohol. For men, it's only two drinks per day, two standard drinks, two beers, two glasses of wine. Wine is only five ounces, not an 11-ounce glass of wine, five-ounce glass of wine, or a 12-ounce can of beer. So when I was in high school, and I don't know what it's like now, but it was a rite of passage. And one of the rites of passage was to drink a six pack of beer. Am I alone? Does anybody else go through that in high school? It's like, that's what you did, right? OK, so no one ever said to me in high school, in any type of educational class, if you drink a six pack of beer on Friday night, before, during, and after the high school football game, you're at risk for alcoholism for an alcohol use disorder. I never knew that. I thought that was what everyone did. OK, so you could call it binge drinking. That would be a proper term for it. So it doesn't take very much to put a person at risk. OK, so past month binge and heavy alcohol use among people age 12 or older by age group and this is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. This is a survey that gets sent to your home, and you fill it out, and you turn it in. Nobody calls or anything. So they've been doing this kind of survey, um, this organization, for many, many years. So it measures prevalence. So we're looking at how many people actually have this issue. So when you think of prevalence, think of how much water is in a bathtub compared to incidence. What's the incidence of something happening? That's water flowing into the bathtub. Water flowing in, water flowing out. The incidence is the rate, the movement. Prevalence is how much is water is actually in the tub. So prevalence, how many people are actually doing something in a certain population? And here our population is the United States, age 12 or older. So you can see percent using in the past month, this is 12 and over. So this is for all three of these groups combined. It's about 25% for binge alcohol use and about 6.1% for heavy alcohol use, which would be defined as at-risk using, OK? So interestingly, there's not a lot of binge drinking in this 12 to 17 age group. And the most common substance uh, of abuse in this age group is marijuana, OK? But when you get to 18, you can see how dramatically it goes up in terms of binge use. So this is high school, end of high school, and college years, where you can see binge drinking is going up. Is playing college sports a risk protective factor 
for using alcohol or developing an alcohol use disorder? What do you think? No, no. Unfortunately, all of us that want our kids to be, you know, Division I college athletes, it's not helpful in terms of uh, not developing a substance use disorder. I had to study that for my test. That's how I know that. I would never know that otherwise. <laughs> okay, so and then you see 26 and older. Um, still, the use is pretty high. It kind of mimics what we have here. So binge drinking versus heavy drinking, it definitely goes up from this age group right here. Okay. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about marijuana, this most commonly used substance in the middle school and high school age. And this is a study, and I'll preface this by saying that studies related to cannabis use and IQ are somewhat equivocal. There's potentially some problems with studying them. And so I'm going to give you what this study showed, OK? Um, but there are some, some issues with this study, just like there's issues with all of these kinds of studies. But there's probably an important point here. And the important point here is looking at, at what happens to your IQ if you use marijuana regularly or if you actually have cannabis use disorder. And under no circumstances does your IQ go up. Okay, that's the bottom line. That's the take home message. And if your child tells you, um, you know, I study stoned and therefore I take my test stoned and I do better, there is zero evidence for that. Zero. Okay, so, but I remember hearing that and thinking, maybe that's true. Could that possibly be true? It's not. So this study looked at a thousand people over a period of age from 18 to 38 and basically it showed an IQ decline associated with regular use and dependence, a dose response related to persistence. So the more you use, the bigger the problem is. Now, for those of you that are adults that might be using marijuana, it is legal, right? Um, the evidence does not show that our IQ really drops if we're not using persistently and chronically. So that's good news. Okay. They looked at education, recent use, other substances, and even schizophrenia. No real difference with controls. And a common theme throughout this talk is the younger a person starts using, the more adverse effects you're going to see, including an eight-point drop in IQ. OK, so memory loss ahead. That's a real issue. OK, so another associated issue is cannabis use and psychotic symptoms. So what's a psychotic symptom or psychosis? Psychosis is a loss of touch with reality. And we have a prominent psychiatrist here who maybe can elaborate on this better than, than I can. I'm an addiction medicine specialist, by the way. That's my training. So a psychosis is a loss of touch with reality. So it could be a delusion or a false belief. It might be that um, I think I am, am bulletproof. And I really believe I'm bulletproof. That would be delusional. Okay? It could be a hallucination, like I'm hearing my mother talking to me while I'm giving this talk. Or I'm seeing you know, ants crawling up and down and all around. Right. One time I was working at a, at a treatment center, and I thought this person was in delirium tremens because he said, you know, I see ants all over the wall. And I ask him, really, you see ants there? And so I turn around, and sure enough, there's ants climbing all <laughs> on the wall. It's like, OK, all right. <laughs> so, but usually, when they see ants on the wall, they really aren't there. OK, so um, anecdotally, I've had a couple of really, really smart young people in their early 20s that have come to me. And all of them have been at Berkeley. So they're bright kids. They're at Berkeley, and they get sent home. And they come see me, and then I usually refer them to a, an appropriate center. But every one of them came home, and they were psychotic. They were delusional. Every one of them was smoking marijuana. And, of the, and it's only a few, so this is anecdotal. But um, some of them were showing some early signs of schizophrenia. Some of them weren't. But they developed a psychotic disorder, smoking marijuana all day, every day. OK? So this is talking about incident cannabis use and then incident psychotic experiences. So I'm using marijuana, and I'm starting to 
maybe has some type of psychotic symptoms. Maybe it's paranoia. Maybe it's some delusion of something going on. But I stop using marijuana and it goes away. Here is continuing to use cannabis on a regular basis. And now I have this persistent psychotic experience. Okay. Some people will use it to help treat that psychotic experience. But usually it makes things worse. So does that mean, I want to be crystal clear, it does not mean if you smoke marijuana you're going to develop schizophrenia. So please don't take that as a take home message. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there's an association with psychotic disorders in marijuana use. Okay. All right. So here's our adolescent brain. Um, when I started in addiction medicine, we did not know about this right here, cannabinoid 1 receptors. We had no idea. So this is only less than 25 years old that the brain actually has receptors that marijuana binds to. And we ha there's an endogenous neurotransmitter that binds to these cannabinoid 1 receptors. It's called anandamide. And if you think about it, there's actually a value to it. What would be the value of a natural cannabinoid system in our brain? What do you get when you smoke a lot of pot? You get hungry, right? You get the munchies, right? It's not just folklore. It really happens. So part of the cannabinoid system says, hey, eat. Eat food, right? Which I'll segue into. So cannabinoids, including cannabidiol, and THC, THC is the psychoactive cannabinoid, is FDA approved for three things. What three things are they? Does anybody know? Seizures, right. OK, so the first one is a medication that has CBD, and it's called Epodiolax. And it's been out for just a few years, and it's used for people that have sort of a rare seizure disorder. It's usually in children. It's called Dravet syndrome. Um, and that's available and FDA approved for seizures in children, okay? The other two are wasting syndromes. So HIV-related wasting syndrome and cancer-related wasting syn uh, syndrome. So those are the FDA indications for use of CBD, or you could even argue THC, but basically CBD. Right, So all the other things, and I just saw an interesting article that listed 25 or 30 things that CBD is good for. And it was just last year when my daughter was playing soccer that we would go to soccer tournaments and there would be CBD you know, tents up there where it's like, hey, use CBD for this, use CBD for that, this, that, and the other thing. It's not FDA approved for anything except seizures and for HIV and cancer-related wasting syndromes. So despite what the claims are, and I'm sure there'll be some things and we'll say, hey, you know what, that works really well. And probably they'll develop a, formu a formulation at some point that helps with people that have other maybe wasting syndromes, something that would say, hey, you know, it's good to eat. Um, okay, so these CBD receptors, there's CBD1, that's the main one in our brain, and then there's CBD2, which is mostly related to our immune system, they increase from infancy, infancy up to 30 years of age. Okay? And then going to and thinking about how our brains develop, reward, motivation, cognition, that all continues to develop. So remember I showed you the sagittal section of the brain. This is another sagittal section. This is where the limbic system is, and it says Varum, which is like go, you know? Two green lights, let's go, go, go. And you got four loco, that's a popular alcohol drink now. More sleep. That seems to be an adolescent thing, and that's true. It actually is. They need sleep. But here is that self-control. This is the frontal cortex of a brain that says, hmm, maybe that wouldn't be a good idea, whatever it is that I'm thinking about doing. Okay. So I think this is a very important slide that talks about comorbidity of psychiatric illness associated with using marijuana. And I think it makes a very powerful point. So here we're looking at people that use marijuana and the general population. And you can see pretty clearly that this is any mood disorder. 
This is any anxiety disorder. You've got depression, dysthymia, mania, hypomania, panic disorder, panic attacks without agoraphobia, social phobias, which is a big reason why people use, as well as depression and anxiety. Sp certain specific phobias, generalized anxiety. So across the list of psychiatric illness, you can see that I might have started using marijuana because it was actually helping me to be, be less anxious. It might help me to think less about my problems and so I'm feeling less depressed. But at the end of the day, I end up with a much higher risk of developing a psychiatric illness. So I think it's really powerful. OK. So now we're going to uh, talk about opioids. Opioids are the overall sort of umbrella term for opiates, which are naturally occurring opioids, and the synthetic or semi-synthetic. So the natural occurring opiates, they come from the opium, opium uh, from the poppy, which is why if you have a poppy seed bagel, you'll test positive for opiates on a urine drug screen. So if any of you do have to go get tested, don't have a poppy seed bagel the day before, OK? Because uh, it's true, it really will happen. Because the poppy seeds, while there's no psychoactive effect, they still will, will cause your urine to be positive for opiates. So opiates, the two main opiates, um, are morphine and codeine. Everything else is either semi-synthetic, means it has part opiate and something synthetic, or it's fully synthetic, like fentanyl. Okay, so everything is, is sort of um, uh, broken down and compared to morphine. So morphine list is listed as one. So heroin is considered twice as strong as morphine. That's a little hard to um, be very definitive on because it could be cut with all different kinds of products. And so you don't really, really know, but just in general, if you had like a a pharmaceutical grade, which is kind of sounds funny to say it that way, but if you actually had a proper lab creating heroin, milligram for milligram, twice as strong as morphine. And then you got fentanyl, and here's the big problem. It's a hundred times stronger than morphine, a hundred times stronger. And then carfentanil, 10,000 times stronger. So hugely problematic. So fentanyl synthesized primarily in China and transported to the United States. That's where it's coming from right now. So that's the street fentanyl that you see. You'll see it in a powder form that people will use. You'll see it in a pill form. So they'll form pills. So probably some of you have heard about this. So it's hard to find or get pills like Xanax nowadays. So people will somehow get the powder from somewhere and then they'll manufacture their own pill. So it's pretty remarkable. It doesn't really look like it was made at Abbott Labs or something like that. OK. So, so here's our lethal dose of a substance. So you can see this is a lethal dose of heroin. It's a comparison, obviously, right? I don't know how many milligrams are here. But you can see how much heroin compared to fentanyl, a much smaller dose. And then this carfentanil, um, it's an elephant tranquilizer. So it's what's used on elephants, right? This is the size of a couple of grains of salt. If you got that, or if I got that on my finger right now, pure carfentanil on my finger right now, I would die. You could not revive me. You could not give me enough Narcan to bring me back. 911 could not get here quick enough. You could not put a tube down my throat to help me breathe. I would be gone. So fortunately, we don't see that very much, but it's very serious. So why create these? Why make these? Well, to make money, right? Because then you can cut this fentanyl into a non-lethal dose with a bunch of you know, stuff like talc or whatever they want to use. And all of a sudden, you've got $10,000 worth of a drug to sell as opposed to $1,000. And carfentanil, if you could do that safely, you'd have 100000 OK? So this slide is not very exciting or interesting to look at, but it makes a, a very powerful point. So in talking about the opioid epidemic, one of the reasons why it's become such a big deal is because 
of this right here. So they looked at 100 overdose deaths. These are accidental overdose deaths, not suicides. 100 deaths, and this was in a county in Ohio, but it could be this county, frankly. It could be anywhere. And you can see that 99 out of 100 of those accidental deaths, people had fentanyl in them. 99. Carfentanil, a very small percentage, okay? So what's taking over and what's killing people is fentanyl. Interestingly, this is norfentanyl. There's only 64% of norfentanyl. So there's 99% of the fentanyl, but the metabolite, there's only 64% of that. Does anybody know why that would be? It's pretty interesting because you die so fast, the liver doesn't even get a chance to metabolize it. So you use, you overdose, you stop breathing, and everything stops, and you don't even metabolize a lot of the fentanyl. So it's pretty scary stuff. And we had a patient just th this week, he's a 20-something year old, he's been doing fentanyl, and he wants to go home and not do any kind of treatment. And it's like, yikes. I mean, you're at risk for dying. Do you realize that? I mean, you are at real risk for dying. You're playing with fentanyl. You know you're using it. So very powerful stuff. Okay, so in terms of screening now for uh, young people, this is the craft screening tool. For adults, we use something called the CAGE questionnaire. You might have heard of that. For alcohol and drugs, we do the CAGE slash AID um, questionnaire. Well, this is the craft questionnaire, so this is more for adolescents. So we're going to go through the questions because they're a little different than for adults because they're, you know, there's, the, the circumstances are a little different. So have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? Okay, so I would have answered that yes in high school. Probably a lot of you would have too. Do you ever use to relax, feel better about yourself, or fit in? Yes, I would have answered yes to that too. Yikes, I'm already at two or higher. I've, I'm at high risk. I'm only on question two. So do you ever relax, use to relax, feel better about yourself, or fit in? Do you ever use while you are by yourself or alone? Okay, and I, I didn't do that, but yes. Using alone, that's a very important sign, right? Because the way most of us grew up was that using particularly alcohol is a social event, right? You know, if someone tells you that they're drinking by themselves, that's a warning sign, right? That's an immediate warning sign. Do you ever forget things you did while using? Yeah, I didn't do my homework. Do you, does your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down? That's an interesting conversation to have your high school friends say, hey, man, maybe you ought to cool it a little bit, huh? Because if your parents say it, that's one thing, right? But when a, 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 your best friend says, geez, man, you seem a little out of control, that's a wake-up call, right? Wouldn't you agree that, you know, that the, the, the social sort of importance of our peers at that age is really, um, is very high? And so if a friend says, hey, wow, things seem a little out of control, that's a wake-up call. Have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using? Uh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> okay, so scoring two or higher indicates high risk. So when I gave this talk to the eighth graders, what I really enjoyed was that, um, well, they whispered a lot more, and so um, they didn't appreciate the social norm of being polite and quiet during a lecture, but I could hear them asking themselves, and they were reading, and they were talking about it, and they were thinking about it, which I thought was really great. So no one ever gave this to me when I was in high school and said, hey, you know what? If you drink a six-pack uh, uh, on the weekends, Friday night, you're at risk for an alcohol use disorder. Holy cow, I didn't know that. Did you want to try to answer this questionnaire? No. Well, that might have been a good idea. So um, you could look that up. Uh, it's easy to get online. It's called Craft, OK? All right, so here's my favorite slide. OK, riding in the car here. I love the dog's expression here. So it's not exactly like riding with someone who's intoxicated, but I still love this slide because that's sort of the, the fear of, oh my god, what have I got myself into? Okay, 
I couldn't resist. All right, we are going to, oh, we'll talk a little bit about this, then we're going to go on into vaping. So an important part of how we talk to our kids is having credibility, right? We need to have credibility, and our message needs to be credible, right? And one of the things that, that I like to think about when I'm talking with people and, and sort of thinking about, well, how, does, how is medicine practice? How do we address these things? What if I owned a BevMo store, you know? If I owned a BevMo store, that's an alcohol store, and I was working as a cashier, I'm pretty confident that there would be people coming in that had an alcohol use disorder, and I'm selling them alcohol, right? But how do I really know? So if there's a certain percentage of the population that has an alcohol use disorder or a substance use disorder, and let's say it's 10% or even 20%, there's the other side of it, which is 80 or 90%. So that's a reality. I think it's important when we're presenting it so that we have credibility, which is, you know, your nose doesn't fall off every time you smoke marijuana, right? And to, and to act like it does doesn't really fit with what the teenager says, hmm, that doesn't really fit. That's not what I see. That's not the perceived risk that I have, right? And it may be true for, you could say it's not maybe, it is true for things like alcohol, whatever the substance is. But what we can say is that there's certain risks. So what are some of the substances that are at the highest risk of developing dependence? What would it be? What would be an example of one? Like the highest, you use this drug, you have the highest risk of having a use disorder. Nicotine. Nicotine would be at the top of the list. And then after that would be opioids, in particular heroin. So that might be as high as 30%, right? 25, 30%. For marijuana, it's about 9%. So the statistics are that if someone uses marijuana, let's say high school, college age, right? About 9% of them will develop a cannabis use disorder. That's the appropriate term, okay? So when we're sending out a message that we have to say, yes, marijuana is addictive, but not everyone gets addicted. That's true, right? We can also send out the message that just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. Nicotine in the form of cigarette is legal and it is the, by far the most lethal drug and lethal um, manner in using a drug that exists, 450,000 deaths a year. So nicotine is legal for adults in the form of cigarettes and it's legal in the form of vaping. We're gonna talk about that. Alcohol is legal. Alcohol is very toxic to our bodies. If we made our legal, if we made the determination of whether or not it's dangerous to us and, and imposed a legal, you know, some, some type of legality to it, and we're consistent, smoking and alcohol use would be illegal, right? And that's another thing you have to combat, you know? Then you have to say, well, see, pot is an herb, right? It's grown in the ground, it must be okay. Well, you know, cocaine comes from coca leaves grown in the ground, and opium and heroin come from um, poppy plants. Actually, heroin's semi-synthetic, so just in case they fight. Because I don't know about you, but my sixth grader already thinks she's an attorney that just goes in every angle. It's like a loophole with everything, including that's so unfair. All right, let's see. Marijuana can be harmful, but not everyone is harmed, okay? Broader use leads to broader problem use and access and decreased perceived harm. So that's true. It's a huge problem here, and especially for vulnerable populations. And what are we gonna do about the fact that it's legal? What are we gonna do about the fact that you know, there are some medications that are using a CBD product that are FDA approved, and there are some valid reasons for using them. So there's a lot to be um, determined, but you could argue that, well, alcohol is legal, that's another example, but that opioids are legal, and it's a huge problem, right? But they're legal and they're necessary, and if you're going in and you're having your knee replaced tomorrow, you're gonna want pain pills, I guarantee it, because it hurts, it hurts bad. Okay and then recreational commercialization. So we're gonna talk a little bit about marketing. Okay, all right, we're gonna go on to vaping now. 
<clears throat> True or false? E-cigarettes are FDA approved for treatment of tobacco use disorder or tobacco use disorders in adults. True or false? False. That is right. Yay, way to go. It is false. FDA-approved medications are nicotine replacement therapy, Wellbutrin, it's an antidepressant, and then a, a medication called Shantix, or Varenicline is the generic name. So e-cigarettes are not FDA-approved under any circumstances for anything. Okay. All right, so here we go. Here is Capital Unified School District. 2017-2018 California Healthy Kids Survey. 22% of juniors in Capo Unified School District high schools have used e-cigarettes or other vaping products in the last 30 days. So that was last year, right? Okay. Oh no, that's two years ago. Thank you. God, 2020. Coming up soon. Okay, this is teen e-cigarette use and this is a national survey. So you can see cigarettes and you see e-cigarettes. And first thing to notice is the decline in cigarettes. And you think, man, that is really great. That is really great. And then you see this boom, 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 boom. A little off here, but basically it's skyrocketing now, right? The perceived risk is lower with these cigarettes. And really, up until three, four months ago, nobody had heard of what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, Evoli, which is e-cigarette and vaping associated lung illness. So we didn't have any cases. So it's all been brought to light now as a result of the dangers that the perceived risk and the real risk are really different. Okay. So e-cigarettes, what is it? It's a battery operated device. It heats a liquid that contains nicotine, although it could have something else. It could have Marijuana, people put opioids in there. It creates a vapor that's inhaled. And I'm sure some of you have seen somebody, you pull up to a stoplight and then someone blows out a cloud of what looks like, how in the world, how big are our lungs, right? It's like, oh my God, it's amazing. So that's a vaporized product that's being exhaled. Entered the US market in 2006. So here are some pictures of vaping products. If you go um, online, you see all kinds of images that make it look pretty cool. Um, that may not be the coolest looking one, but there's lots that make it look really attractive to kids, including what we saw with Leonardo DiCaprio, right? Um, one of the most common uh, e-cigarette devices is Juul a Juul product, which looks like a USB drive. So that is a very popular appearing, popular uh, e-cigarette and uh, very easy to uh, use and also hide. Oops. Okay, so e-cigarettes. The nicotine content varies and ranges from anywhere from zero to 36 milligrams per ml. An important point is that uh, these e-cigarette manufacturers, they are not obligated by law to say what's in the cigarette or in the e-cigarette uh, device. So that will change and that will change soon. So propylene glycol, glycerol, used as humectants, 7,000 or more flavors. Here's a couple examples of this. Doesn't that look like Fanta, right? It sure does, right? It's Fanta. But it looks like Fanta. I'd say if you weren't looking carefully, you'd say, do you put this into like, you know, a Pellegrino and you get Fanta out of it, right? That's what I would think. And then you see you got Nilly Vanilli wafers. It's been so long since I've had one of these. I don't remember if it's Nilly Vanilla or Milly Vanilla. I think that's a band, right? <laughs> From a long time ago. They were like a one hit wonder, weren't they? Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm showing my age all of a sudden. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so, but here's importantly, all these other compounds, tin, lead, nickel, chromium, mag manganese, okay, cancer-producing agents. I'm not saying that 
Some, all of these are, but some of them are. And that was the big marketing tool of e-cigarettes, right? They don't cause cancer, right? Well, they actually can. And, and as we progress over time, we'll see that there are cancers that are associated with e-cigarettes. But even more importantly, they're causing acute lung disease and people are dying. OK. Not to mention the fact that millions of people are getting hooked on nicotine. OK. So what do teens say is in their e-cigarette? 66% say it's just flavoring. Isn't that remarkable? Now, can you have just flavoring in an e-cigarette? Yes, you can. But do you really think two-thirds of them have just flavoring? No way. No way. So a lot of them don't even know what's in the e-cigarette. Some of them are being honest. About 6% are being honest and say, yeah, it's pot. I know it's pot. Another 13% are saying, yeah, it's nicotine. I know it's nicotine. They're saying, I don't know. Another 13%. But it's remarkable that saying it's just flavors, which is why people are coming down so hard on all these manufacturers using flavors that are enticing to children. I mean, kids, but you could be a child. Like going back to this slide, I mean, doesn't this look like what you serve your three-year-old? You know, is that the, I'm sorry, the slide's not very good, but it, it's like an, an apple juice, right? So it's crazy. Okay, so some of these slides are literally hot off the presses. So flavors used most often among US 10th graders, and this is past 30 day Juul e-cigarette users. So we're gonna talk about Juul, not to pick on Juul, but Juul deserves to be picked on as well as all of them do. So e-cigarette flavor, and you can see right at the top of the list is mint. And then next is mango, and then you've got fruit, you've got other, but it's basically mang uh, mint, and fruity flavors, right at the top of the list of the most common used by 10th graders. So this prevalence here, remember the amount of people using about 40 some odd percent, up almost 45% are using mint flavor. Okay, so vaping hoodie. Has anybody seen the vape hood? E? You have, holy cow. I hadn't until two days ago when I was starting to put this together. I thought, if I'm going to do a slide, I'm going to do a talk about vaping, I've got to be current right up to date because it's changing every day. So I have not heard of the vape hoodie, but there it is. Um, and so you can use it in the classroom, anywhere, anytime, marijuana, nicotine. Um, part of the attraction of Juul and these USB um, uh, a size devices is that they don't produce a lot of smoke, so you can kind of hide it. So can you imagine um, in class? So, okay, so I imagine there'll be others um, that are just as uh, fashion-oriented and sneaky, and we'll have to be constantly, it's like, it's like the thief that knows how to break in, and so you have to keep changing the lock. And every few days, you have to create a, a bigger, better, stronger lock because they've got a new way of, of opening the front door. So the vaping hoodie. OK. All right, so here's what we're talking about. So I hope I'm not disturbing anybody in here. Um, sometimes, because I'm a medical doctor, I, uh, I forget that I see this kind of stuff on a regular basis. And so it doesn't really shock me. But I'll tell you this, if this were my darling daughter, I would be a grief-stricken, panicked parent that would be driving the ICU doctors crazy, even at my own hospital, because I would not know how to manage that emotionally in my child. So here he is, he's intubated, that means the tube's down his throat, because he can't breathe on his own. Got an IV here. What are these? Restraints, so he's being restrained probably because he's agitated. Maybe he's agitated because of what he's been using. Maybe he's agitated because he's trying to breathe and he can't breathe. Maybe it's just the best way to calm him down so that he doesn't pull out a tube because he needs that tube in order to breathe. He doesn't pull out the IV because they have to give him medication. But this is no joke. So the CDC came up with a name. It's called Evali, e-cigarette, 
and vaping associated lung illness or injury. And that came out probably about a month, maybe a month and a half ago now. And that's what we're talking about in terms of real risk and perceived risk with vaping. This came out of vaping. OK, so here's a young lady. This is a true story. This is really her, although I don't know her name. And she used social media, a positive uh, ex uh, experience with social media, to try to help figure out what's going on. And she was part of what helped us to discover that it's these dank vapes that seem to be the problem. They are bootleg THC cartridges. So what people were doing was they were getting a bootleg cartridge related to, or that had marijuana, and it probably had some type of toxic product in it. And that's what's led to most of the injuries and illnesses, and even deaths. So good for her. OK, so where are we at as of today? <clears throat> Vitamin E oil, or vitamin E acetate, appears to be linked. So we've had 2,051 probable cases of Evoli, 163 new cases diagnosed in the last week. This, I think, was just from two, two days ago. Patients have been found in 49 states, the District of Columbia, Virgin Islands. The number of confirmed fatalities rose from 37 to 39, and I think there was a, another couple in California in the past day or two. They found the potential breakthrough in the product, narrowing it to this vitamin E acetate as a potential toxin of concern. So what they did was they did studies looking at 29 people that had died. And they found on toxicology studies that some percentage had nicotine. I think it was around, I don't remember the percentage, but out of the 29, I believe it was around 8 or 10. And then they found that marijuana, there was about 14 or 15 out of the 29. Maybe it was 18. It was a little higher percentage. So the smallest percentage of the main toxic products, nicotine, then marijuana, but 29 out of, t oops, oh, good. 29, oh, shoot, sorry. 29 out of 29 had this vitamin E acetate. So that's probably the culprit. And we'll know more. So we don't know for sure. But all of them had vitamin E. And what does that mean? Does that mean go home and throw out your vitamin E? No. Don't do that. You don't need to do that. Okay? There's something about how it's getting probably altered. Well, I shouldn't say pharmacologically. Molecularly, it's getting altered so that when you smoke it in the form of a vape, it produces some toxic product, probably some toxic sort of pneumonitis or something like that. So as an example, as an analogy, I was involved in a legal case as an expert witness. And a young lady had been in the hospital. She was an opioid use disorder patient. And she was getting discharged. And she wanted her IV narcotics. They weren't giving them to her. So she got some oral narcotics, like some oral Vicodin, crushed it up really fine got it into a syringe, had been in the hospital a bunch, so she knew how to do it, knew what she was doing at some level with an IV, and she injected herself with sterile water and crushed up Vicodin. And within 24 hours, she was dead. Because pills contain products, in this case it was cross-providone, and they, they have fillers, and those fillers don't belong in your lungs. So there's nothing in that filler that's a problem if you take the pill orally, but if you used it intravenously, well, it led to her death. So there's something about vitamin E in a vaping situation that is potentially life-threatening to our lungs. So please don't throw away your vitamin E. You don't need to hide your vitamin E from your teenager. That's not going to be an issue, OK? All right. Action being taken to reduce vaping. So here we are in Laguna Niguel looking at a ban on the sale of flavored e-cigarette products. Well, that's great. 100% support that. That's very important. Um, in San Francisco, believe it or not, they've banned the sale of all e-cigarettes. And it'll start, I think, in 2020. I'm not sure when exactly it's going to start, but it was 
recently voted on the November election, was, it was, it was um, rejected as a ballot measure. So the, whatever city council, they elected to uh, ban the sale, and then when it went on a, as a voter measure in the ballot in November, they um, rejected the idea of uh, basically removing that, uh, that uh, uh, new legal implication that they have. So bottom line is that San Francisco is going to ban e-cigarettes. Here we are with Juul Labs. By the way, Juul is um, out of the Bay Area. So it's one of the main companies up there, or one of many, but October 17th. So here's a pretty remarkable thing. If you think about a large company and what they've done just in a matter of three weeks. So Juul, based out of San Francisco Bay Area, on October 17th is no longer selling certain flavored e-cigarettes pods, including mango, cream, fruit, and cucumber. So I showed you that slide earlier, right? So just three weeks ago, they said, okay, we're not gonna sell these. Now, just not even a week ago, they said, okay, we're going to stop selling mint, which they've said accounts for 70% of their revenue. And today I saw where they said they're going to um, be downsizing and they're laying off a couple of hundred people. So Juul is bleeding badly. So isn't that remarkable? So the power of all this, I've never seen a large company make such dramatic changes and then boom and then again, boom, wow. Okay, well, that's great. So we've got a long way to go. And painfully, hopefully this will not happen, but as we go through this process, the bootlegging of these products won't end up causing more problems than we anticipated. Because the bootlegging marijuana definitely is a problem. And if we get bootlegging flavors put together by chemists that aren't really chemists, we're going to have a problem. OK. so. For more information, so this literally came out today um, by, the, um, by CDPH, uh, Department of Health uh, Services here in the state of California, so to ra raise awareness. So if, if you want to take notes or anything, take a picture of this. There is an advertising campaign targeting young adults and parents called Outbreak. So you could look for that on TV, radio, and online. So it's called Outbreak. I haven't looked at it, so I can't vouch for it, but presumably it's something uh, of value called outbreak. And then um, looking at symptoms, okay, so for young adults, it's called vape outbreak, and parents should visit fa uh, flavor sh uh, shook kids. Flavors hook kids, thank you, God. <laughs> I think I'm wearing out. I don't know if my voice sounds like I'm wearing out, but I feel like I'm wearing out a little bit, and I'm almost done, thank goodness. So flavors hook kids, yes. <laughs> So literally, I got this slide at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So I apologize for not reading it more carefully. But I think it's, it's worthwhile taking a look at these. And of course, nowadays, it's easy to go online. You can see lots of resources. But in terms of providing resources on education, how to talk to our kids, these sound like good ideas. So my takeaways are most substance use starts in adolescence. I think we've made that point very clear. The younger a person starts, the more likely a substance use disorder will develop, and the more likely it will lead to medical and or psychiatric diet disorders. I think that's been made clear too, right? I hope it has. So if you can keep your kids from using, the difference between even starting at 21 versus 18 or 21 versus 14 is huge. It makes a huge difference. Okay. Marketing efforts to make substances attractive to adolescents is pervasive, and we saw some pictures of that. And so it's whether it's marketing directly or indirectly through Instagram and Snapchat and all these other um, apps. And then finally, our brains continue to develop until we're at least 25 years of age, and drugs and alcohol adversely affect our developing brains. So I go back to the quadratic equation or getting stoned. Let's see. Which one am I going to choose, right? And that's a choice for a lot of people, right? I'm going to study this foreign language, or I'm going to get jacked up every afternoon. And most of the people that I see, and I treat adults, if we go back to their beginning history, it's, yeah, I was smoking pot daily in high school, or something like that. Or I began drinking regularly in high school. Or I got pills and I got started on it back then. So. Um, 
I want to thank you all for being such a wonderful audience and um, being so kind and thoughtful and try not to remember the flavors hook kids uh, little faux pas. Um, I think we're going to open it up for our panel now. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Doctor. I want to invite the panelists up here, please. And then if you do have comment cards or questions, please pass those to the ends and we'll gather those while we're getting settled. Millie Vanilli, does anyone know that group? 1990? Yes. I, st I think I still have their album. Yeah, it is. We're live streaming this, so you can go back. It's it'll be recorded. You can watch the you can watch the recording um, on our website and at CUSD Insider. So as we get started, um, we'll gather the question cards and then I will ask our panel briefly to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Dr. Sina Safai. I'm a child psychiatrist, um, medical director of the Hogue Aspire programs. Newport Beach and Irvine. I'm also the team doctor, or one of the team doctors for the LA Chargers and an MLB certified doctor as well. My name is Dave Cook, licensed marriage and family therapist with the Aspire program in Newport Beach. My name is Prina Rao. I'm the clinical manager for the Hogue Aspire program working alongside this fabulous team and Dr. Cena as well. Thank you. So we have one question from the audience, and then what I'm going to ask actually is our panel to, to add anything that they wish, um, either in, in practice or what you see on a, on a regular basis that may help parents or families watching. Um, the, the question we got from the audience was, what's the best way to get a kid off vape? The best way? Um, there's a couple ways, actually. I don't know if things a particular best way because every kid's going to be unique and Dr. I can answer this question as well. Um, some kids can go off cold turkey from what I've heard from patients and studies about three, four weeks of nicotine cessation is usually enough to hopefully get off cold turkey, although that's easier said than done. It's the most addictive substance on the planet. Um, and that's why it's like Dr. I brought up earlier, it is, one, it is one of the easiest to get hooked onto, even including heroin and opiates as well. Um, that being said, sometimes switching over to Nicorette gum, which is FDA approved. Um, if you go to their website, they have a specific algorithm and strategy on how to get off uh, nicotine. It's and with specific dosing that you just titrate down over time to prevent some of the nicotine withdrawals. But for some people, going cold turkey is easiest. For some kids, they just can't stop. They're literally addicted. And so they sometimes have to get sent off to different treatment programs, sometimes going to wilderness. Uh, program um, just so they can get away from not only the, the nicotine itself but the temptation to use from their friends and some of those negative influences as well. And, and just to add, um, <clears throat> many of these um, young people will also have another substance use disorder, whether it's marijuana or alcohol use, so a proper substance use disorder treatment program would be a good idea. So another question I guess I have was, if a, if a parent suspects it or they know that it's going on, wh what do you recommend or what do you think is the first thing they should do? And then what does treatment look like after that? Well, I think the first thing is to sit down and have a conversation with them. I think it's important to um, not get upset about the situation. It's an upsetting situation, but how you approach it with your teen is going to be the most important factor in terms of their receptivity to what you're saying. So maybe identifying a, a proper time to sit down and speak with them and share your concerns on a um, on a level where you're not speaking at them, but you're speaking to them in a way where you're, you're showing concern for their health and their well-being. And what treatment looks like in the event you identify a possible substance use problem or um, vaping or any situation related to that, because they sometimes do go hand in hand, unfortunately, is that there are treatments out there for um, teens that can attend either 30, 60, or 90 day programs for um, substance use problems. Typically also, there is a, a reason why your teen is using substances first, is because they're trying to suppress a primary mental health issue. So a lot of the times we get parents say, my, my son's not depressed, um, he just smokes marijuana. Well, 
the reason he smokes marijuana is because more than likely he's depressed. So identifying the primary mental health condition first is what's going to be um, the first tactic that parents really need to take a look at and asking your teen, why do you feel you need to use? Are you struggling with something? Do you feel sad? Do you feel anxious? Really talking to them um, and getting on their level to really make them feel comfortable is where that conversation is going to start. Um, as we know, academic pressures are sort of the number one issue that a lot of teens are struggling with at the moment when it comes to the pressures they're experiencing with keeping up with their peers or certain colleges they want to get into, or even the pressures that sometimes it's parents we, do, we put on our children as well because we do want, that, want the best for them and want them to succeed. But having a conversation at the right time, meaning not when they first get in the car from school, but when you take them out to lunch or going out to a dinner and just speaking to them out of sheer concern is the best way to have that, that situation and that, that approach. I'll just jump in and add on that too. I think that's probably one of the most important slides that we looked at tonight in terms of teens is just the comorbidity of uh, mental health issues with a substance use issue. So a lot of the teens that we work with at Aspire are using substances to medicate uh, a primary mental health issue. And oftentimes I think parents minimize the severity of what their teen is actually going through. So my teen's not really that depressed or that anxious. And in reality, I think they are. Um, so having a more open conversation, kind of validating how the teens are feeling, being able to connect with them and understand why they're using substances to kind of deal with or mask kind of the, the overwhelming feelings they're going through. Yeah, I could add to that too. So alcohol, marijuana, the two most, and nicotine too, but nicotine's more of a stimulant. Um, the other drugs are literally depressant. So they're not only depressant on your physiology, but they're depressant in terms of increasing r rates of anxiety and depression, which are the two most commonly uh, diagnose issues that we deal with that aspire and that being said even at our program where we do have kids who are abusing drugs and alcohol but we're not a primary dual diagnosis program which we're a primary mental health program and not a dual diagnosis program which would specialize in not only mental health issues but also substance abuse issues as well and there's no doubt there's some kids there that just love getting high and love getting drunk and just getting intoxicated so those kids you can say the chicken or the egg it's sometimes it's hard to know how this all started but there's no doubt a majority of these young young people are adding fuel to the fire when it comes to self-medication. Yeah, I would agree. And <clears throat> one other topic that um, is certainly uh, a huge challenge and difficult to talk about is uh, uh, trauma-related issues. And we should not forget that adolescents uh, have traumatic issues in their lives. And uh, I see that all the time in folks that I end up treating as an adult. Thank you. So uh, let's say you're a parent who started having these conversations with your kids and you feel like you need help professionally, um, but the child is resistant. So what does that conversation look like and what would you recommend for parents at that point? So like uh, Prina brought up earlier, you want to initiate this conversation in a non-judgmental way. Um, sometimes it's a lot easier said than done. And, and some kids are so far deep um, in the addiction itself, or even if it's a mental health issue, that they're just not there cognitively. The insight isn't there. They're not aware of how severe the issue is. And so it's incumbent on us as adults and as a society to realize like, we're not gonna leave it to a child to decide their own medical care. That's why they don't have executive decision making. That's why they don't have those legal rights. And so at some point, we've gotta call a spade a spade. If your child is addicted to one of these drugs, there's no doubt it's leading to a precipitous decline in their functioning. So if that's like academic functioning or social functioning, they're becoming more and more progressively withdrawn from society. That's where we have to get treatment with or without their permission. And that's a, more of a measure of last resort. But at some point, it's analogous, or it is analogous to a medical issue. So if they were having, I brought this up at another talk recently, if they were having like a bone sticking out of the leg, let's say the femur, the largest bone in, in the human body is sticking out in a compound fracture, you're not gonna ask the child their permission to get treatment. At some point, you're gonna take them to the ER, pin them down, they're gonna sedate the hell out of them, send them to an OR and call it a day, because we're not gonna leave it up to a child to, to dictate their own medical care. And I, I don't want to be an authoritarian or patronizing paternalistic type doctor, but ultimately it's about sometimes saving when it comes to like overdose potential, we're talking about opiates, we're talking about alcohol, especially these are things that can go overboard really quickly. Uh, we have to, to take the bull by the horns and, and get these kids treatment. I had one case real briefly, um, speaking about fentanyl, this is the most egregious case I've ever heard of actually, and it still terrifies me. I actually hope he's alive because we were so worried about him. Um, this kid was abusing fentanyl on his own, was getting patches from somewhere, 
pinpricking it with a needle and then dropping it in his mouth, sometimes in his eyes. And one day he went a little bit overboard, one extra drop. He, in his own mind, said, I'm about to overdose. So he grabbed, of course, he had access to Adderall too, grabbed his Adderall, crushed it up, snorted it. After the fact, he's telling us the only reason why he's alive is because he crushed the Adderall and he saved his own life. We're like, no, dude, like, you are only alive because we injected Narcan into you. Your mom found you purple and dead. But he didn't see that. And he still doesn't, if I had to guess to this day. And so those are the types of cases where we told the parents, and mom and dad were obviously super concerned, but they weren't willing to make those extremely difficult steps, which are like, your kid is so far gone that we can't leave it up to him to decide whether he's going to get treatment or not. He's probably going to be dead in the next couple of days, unless, next couple of weeks, unless we do something legitimate. So that's one brief example of a case where it's, you're not going to sit there and negotiate with a child who's having those types of issues, and ultimately the parents and the doctors who are involved had to step in and, and give recommendations that are difficult to give, and they're, e they're even harder to administer. So we appreciate that, but ultimately we want to make sure that these kids are getting structure and supervision, especially when the cases are that acute. Okay, so for Prana and Dave, you get a kid who doesn't want to be there. And sometimes it's better, I think, and easier for parents to sort of visualize what does this look like when you send a child who doesn't want to be there and has probably threatened a whole bunch of stuff against you. But when they get in your office, what does that conversation look like with you? And I know it's probably different every time, but wh how does that start? Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> I think we encounter this more often than, uh, often than not. So from a clinical perspective, I like to meet with the teen separate from the parents, try to get some buy-in from the teen too. Um, I, do, I do think it takes some level of motivation to come to treatment. So even if the teen's at five out of 10 motivation to show up, um, I try to encourage the teens to give it two weeks, uh, see if we can get some buy-in. We try to really get down to their level um, talk, and then even get parents buy-in too. So having parents set appropriate boundaries too. Um, if you're not gonna participate at this level and you still need help, then we're gonna escalate it to a higher level of care if they need wilderness. Um, but I think we do a great job of getting buy-in buy with the teens and being able to just meet, meet them where they're at and, and, and encourage them and um, give them a lot of positive reinforcement for attending treatment. So we know it's a pretty big time commitment in the afternoon, but uh, we, we definitely see a lot of positive results, I think fairly quickly too. I think what's also um, unique and different about the program is it's not really a process-oriented sort of kumbaya, let's hold hands and talk about our feelings type of program where teens are really not receptive to that. It really is a skills-based program where we teach them a scenario or a situation that they're encountering that's similar to the entire group. And then what is the skill that you would use in place of that if you're struggling with emotional regulation or distress tolerance skill? Or how do you engage and learn mindfulness? So it's more real world conversations that we're having with the teens rather than more so sugarcoating or these flowery terminology that we're identifying with them. The other thing that I think is really beneficial is we talk to the parents and say, what all have you tried so far and what's going to be the final call in the event your teen is not willing to do a program like an outpatient program? The next step is usually inpatient or residential long-term treatment. A lot of teens that we've spoken to don't want that. They don't want to be sent away. They don't want to go away somewhere else, away from friends, family, the comfort of their home. So this is where we use that as a motivating tactic and say, look, you're, you're supposed to be here. It's an eight-week program. We're here to help you and help you identify some skills. We're not going to ask you to come in here and talk about your feelings. Give it some time. Give it a try, and let's see how it goes. Typically, when we have that conversation with them one-on-one, -on -one, they, they do seem to be much more receptive versus us sitting with their parents, and it's more so finger-pointing at what's going on. I think the other benefit is the parents are mandated to participate in the program as well. So it doesn't just make it all about the teen and saying, well, this is all your fault. This is all because of you, our family is like this. Because I can tell you as a, as a therapist, it really is not. It's a family systemic issue when it comes to communication and really understanding the rationale of why those decisions are being made by your teen and what can we do to help support you and your family and the growth of communication within the family dynamics that you guys have as well. Yeah, just, just to jump back in on that too. So part of the parent program is parents have to come twice a week for an hour to learn the same coping skills the teens are learning. Um, I think it's pretty eye-opening for the parents as well to understand maybe the severity of the mental health issues their teens are experiencing, but also how to communicate with them in a more effective way that invites conversation rather than is very punitive and kind of authoritarian style parenting. So 
having the parents come and show up, um, it means a lot to the teens too. So a lot of teens just having their parent make the commitment to show up along with them is, is huge because a lot of times uh, maybe they feel like the identified patient in the family where they're the problem. Um, parents have kind of been telling them they're the problem. So uh, I don't want parents to minimize their participation is really important and teens, teens see it. You know, one thing I want to jump on real quick. Um, we've had two families, I think, in the last two months come and tell us that we saved their marriage as a team just because of that family component. The parents were not, at least in those two cases, the parents were not aligned um, when it came to how to um, attack this problem along with like what we're trying to do to help them out. And so some of the skills that they picked up during the programming, the way they found commonality and um, and, and along with some of some of our assistants as well, we're able to, to come to a common goal, which is helping their child, putting their own egos on the side and doing what it takes to help out our children as fast as possible. I think what's also been really beneficial and different about our program is we um, took it one step further and received a WASC accreditation. So we're accredited through the Western Association of Schools and Colleges to be able to give up to five elective credits to teens that attend our program. And we're the first mental health program in Southern California to have that accreditation. When WASC came up to us, they were shocked to see a sort of a mental health program that they were, we were identifying as supplementary education. At the end of that accreditation, at the end of that day, they said, we hope that more programs like this come out because the bridge between mental health and school has to start happening now. I've spoken with a lot of educators, um, a lot of directors within the school systems. You know, we're working and collaborating with almost six major school districts. And an educator said, I can, I can teach the heck out of a kid. I know what to teach them. I know exactly how to do it. But how do I manage them behaviorally or their mental health issues? I have no idea how to navigate that. I have no idea what to do in the classroom, how to address it. And this is why we're sort of here, is to start having these conversations. Because if we don't start taking care of our children, who's going to do it? And literally, the term, it takes a village, really resonates now more than ever, based on a lot of the challenges that our teens are starting to experience, more so than any other generation that we've grown up with or otherwise. Thank you. So um, for each of you, what, what does success look like then? Like if you're gonna tell a if you're gonna tell a parent, what does this look like on the other side of 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 you know me getting my child here with you today with these with these challenges and issues? What does it look like at the end? <clears throat> well, uh, let me start first by saying that I treat adults, um, but you could argue that most of the eighteen year olds that I treat are barely adults. Um, they're legally adults, but they're not really a whole lot different from 17 or 19. And so um, we, we tend to use the term recovery as opposed to sobriety uh, more now. Um, it doesn't mean that abstinence from drugs of abuse isn't um, critically important, but what does recovery look like? So if I'm a high school senior and I've been um, having a problem, let's say, with alcohol and vaping, um, but I'm not kicked out of school, and um, you know I have some desire to get to college and so on. You know, what would recovery look like? Well, first of all, it would be abstaining, um, but it would also be participating in treatment, having the family participate in treatment, and um, maybe developing a better sense of self when it's all said and done. Maybe starting to look at some of the underlying issues that if I address them now, they won't be something that holds on to me for the rest of my life. Like, I really do have an issue with depression. I, I'm a depressed person. I don't even know why I'm depressed, but I feel depressed. Or I'm anxious. I just can't go over the idea of, I, I'm an anxious person, and I don't even have a reason to be anxious. My family life is fine, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I like to use the word recovery, meaning um, that I am uh, better adjusted to live life um, with the circumstances that I have, um, that I'm making progress, and that I have, to use maybe another term, a sense of well-being. In other words, that there's something about how I'm moving forward in life that makes me feel good about me. So that would be one way I would think about it. I would say um, for us as a treatment team and just in general when you're treating patients, we want to hopefully change the trajectory 
of how these kids are doing when we're talking about teens especially. And that's why it's so rewarding to treat young people because you are actually able to change the trajectory or hopefully better able to than you would as an adult. That has to do with just more support systems and of course with brain development. Once you hit 25 and plus, that, that plasticity, that malleability, the moldability of the brain is just much reduced. So the changes that we can make now for these kids are gonna be more consequential than they may be for adults. And then I would say on top of sobriety and abstinence, it would be maintenance of that sobriety and then being an active participant and being actively engaged in your sobriety and maintaining it. Because ultimately, if, if, we're, if we're having a sudden shift, it's kind of like the eye of the storm sometimes where you're not actually, um, <clears throat> you're not in that contemplative state of change and willing to make those real, real difficult changes. And so what I worry about when you have these 180 differences overnight that it could easily f flip right back 180. So that's where the maintenance comes in. Uh, and it's really important. I would say it's one of the most important things. That's hard to follow. <laughs> I think success looks different for every teen. So we've had teens that have come to the program behaviorally out of control. And at the end of the eight weeks, they are, uh, have rejoined the family and the family's moving in a better trajectory. Um, I think just to kind of jump on coping um, in terms of maintenance too, so coping better. Um, taking a look at their coping skills, uh, addressing better ways to cope, not only in school, but as a human too, uh, functioning better with their family. I think even teens being open to continue their treatment after coming to our program and continuing to explore in individual therapy or family therapy, uh, and really just taking an interest in their own life. I think we have a lot of teens that come maybe not feeling the best, so seeing a shift in mood is a huge success. Uh, but, but I think continuing to work on themselves and building from that initial point when they come to our program is a huge success. And uh, I'm, I'm really fortunate that we get to see that week in and week out. I think what's, what's, what I see success is, is that we break the stigma of mental health and, and chemical dependency. I think a lot of parents don't want to acknowledge that their kids are suffering from a mental health condition. It's the reasoning we get is everything from they need a snack versus, um, well, they have everything. They have a beautiful house to live in. They have a car. They have us. Why, why would they be depressed? What is going on? And we have to start looking at it from your mind and your body are not separated. They are one. So as much as uh, it's important for us to get annual physicals every year, it's important to also see a therapist and to have those check-ins as well and to identify what's going on and how life is going and if they're coping well. Because life is difficult for teens as much as uh, we feel like they can just do it and uh, my 16 year old should just know how to do things they really don't and i always tell parents you guys are the best role model for your children you guys are the examples that they are looking at day in and day out and as much as you guys don't think they are observing they really are observing everything you're saying you're doing and your own actions so if we can help continue to break the stigma and encourage getting mental health treatment ongoing therapy i think that's where you will see a lot of what Dr. I stated, recovery and long-term recovery to really help people grow and sustain. Yeah, I want to jump on that. Um, the, uh, when it comes to role models, so I have some parents who are abusing nicotine themselves, marijuana, alcohol, let's say mom and dad are drinking a glass of wine or whatever it may be at the dinner table and they know that their kid has an alcohol issue. It's just unacceptable. It's, that's something that where the parents have to put their own desires to the side and know that if you're gonna to try to lead by example, that's not the best way to do it. So I have some parents who actually need their own treatment because um, they're human too, and we're all wired in different ways. And so there's no doubt there's a, that being said, there's a genetic predisposition. So if the parent is having a substance use issue or has had one in the past, and their kid's gonna be more likely to develop one of those as well. So it's incumbent on the parents to not only be great role models, but also know who their kids are talking to, who the, friend, the family of the friends, like if they're going to like, let's say someone else's home at night, are, are those parents abusing drugs and alcohol? And unfortunately, you know, we're, we're based out of Newport and Irvine and along these coastal towns, sometimes you have parents who are, unfortunately wanna be more friends with their kids than, than parental figures. And I, I throw it back at them and I'm like, well, what if like Billy brought home a 40 or 50 year old man or, or, or woman home? Like how weird would that look? Like, well, that would be horrible. Like, well, then you can't be their friend either. Like you can be their friend when you're older and that's appropriate, but right now I'd rather a parent be a parent and be a friend a little bit lower on the totem pole because that's, they don't need a, an older adult to be their friend. They need their older adult to, again, lead by example and then lay down those boundaries and that structure that sometimes they don't, they don't want, but they need it. And it's incumbent, again, on us as adults to give these kids what, not only what they want, but more importantly, what they actually need. 
So in September, our first um, our first event, we actually Dr. Safaya here and and Prana, and we should probably call it Dr. Safaya's Tough Love because it was a whole hour of that. But it was important for parents to hear, and you can access that video online. So I would recommend if you are interested in social media and um, gaming addiction and mental wellness that that you go to CUSD Insider and check out the live stream channel and you can you can see that presentation there as well um, as we end tonight I just want to ask all four of you if there's if there's any last comments or words and then they will stay so if parents have questions with them individually um, they will be here for a little while just to answer those questions and help you out too I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I know everyone's schedules are so busy, especially in the evenings and whatnot. And so parents coming here, kids too, we really appreciate everyone's time and, and your diligence in trying to get more educated in what we call, we call this like psychoeducation, at least when it comes to mental health, because the more information we have, it's not, knowledge isn't power just on accident. That, that adage didn't come around accidentally. So uh, the more information you guys have as, as parents, as kids, as a society, as a school district, as a community, the more we can actually do something to prevent these kids from suffering, because that's ultimately what this comes down to. We want to reduce suffering. We want to reduce decreases in functionality, and that's why sometimes I, I do adhere to that tough love, but sometimes we need it. Um, and whatever we can do to help out these kids, and that, that's like these community efforts, and again, that's why it's so integral for everyone in here in this room. If you can, not spread this information to others, give them the website so they can look um, at these uh, slideshows and whatnot too, so we can all get educated together. I think I'd like to leave you guys with just parents and teens just check in with each other. So a lot of times parents would just assume that our team's doing okay. Um, but if teens are coming to you and they're, and they're telling you they're not well, there's so many resources in Orange County uh, for mental health, for treatment. Um, seek some out. You know, good place to start is psychology today. We obviously have an intensive outpatient program, uh, but there's a ton of mental health providers. So I really encourage parents to take their teens seriously, especially if they're reaching out to you and letting you know they're not feeling well, that something's not quite right, it's not quite the way it should be. That's a perfect opportunity to check in with them too. Um, and I would just encourage you guys to do that and just say, how are you doing? Uh, let's set a time to talk and chat and maybe not force it, We've had parents do that too, um, mandating time together, but just inviting time together and saying, hey, I'd like to take you out to lunch and just tell me how things are going. How's not just grades and school and um, things academically, but how are you doing as a person? How are you feeling? Um, are you connected with friends? Is, is everything okay? Are you feeling all right? And, and just invite conversation rather than you know, forcing your teen to have awkward conversations. Um, I think that's really beneficial. That's one of the things that I think a lot of parents are surprised by at the end of our program is that we can have an open conversation. We can disagree about certain topics. It doesn't have to turn into a blow up. Um, and we often learn much more about each other than we knew before. And I think it really fosters more close relationships. So we can, we can start to identify when our teens do need help. I think one thing I'd like to leave you all with is um, prevention. We, what we really believe in as a team is preventative work. And um, there are times, unfortunately, where we have parents that call us in crisis situations or have called previously and don't think the issue is very big or it's really major. And later on, come to find out, they call us a few months later and things have gotten so much worse. So prevention is the key here, and there are tons of resources out there, and we'd be more than happy to connect you with resources as well in terms of individual therapists, um, a psychiatrist, or just outpatient programs, whatever it is that you guys might need um, to help support your team. So thank you. And, well, first of all, thank you very much um, for coming. and. Um, I'm thinking about um, over the years if I've learned anything practicing addiction medicine for 25 years and something that's occurred to me recently is that I always thought I was kind of clever and I was pretty good at working with people and sort of you know kind of maneuvering massaging the situation to get what I wanted which was to get them into treatment and into recovery and as it turns out probably the family's influence on a person entering into recovery has much more to do than anything I ever say or do. And so what's been mentioned is tough love, but it's also talking um, to your child or young adult um, is really critical. And as an example, this fentanyl, uh, you know, this young person on fentanyl is only 20 years of age. At the end of the day, 
He didn't want to do treatment, but he's in treatment because his parents said, you know, honestly, you can't come home unless you do treatment. And he likes living indoors. So, <laughs> you know, he wanted to sleep indoors. It sounds like a good idea, sleep in his own bed. But the point is, is that the family's influence is absolutely critical and so important. And setting up um, some boundaries, some tough love, but also some openness to um, engaging with uh, really the most important uh, people in your life, which is your children. So anyways, thank you all for coming. So I just want um, all of you to give one more round of applause to our team from Hogue. We are very, very grateful for your willingness to be here with us, and, and they will be with us again February 26th at 6 p.m., um, and we'll send out information to families, but the topic will be on self-harm and suicide. Um, and a, another very important topic that we hear about a lot when we talk to parents when we go through the school district. And um, so we are just very grateful for your support and your partnership. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.